Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. In this year of drought, the wildlife will be depending on us more than usual. The deer are counting on us too, but we also need plants that they don't chomp to feed the butterflies, bees, and birds. Today, Trisha Martin from Forever Gardens gives us a few ideas. On tour, let's visit Diana Kirby, who's found a balance to care for deer, other wildlife, and her own family garden. Diana Kirby blogs about life's fundamental connections at Sharing Nature's Garden. And that's what her garden is all about, sharing. Homegrown vegetables for her husband Jeff Eller and their children. Plants that support wildlife. And outdoor living where family and friends of all ages can find a spot just right for them. My first memories of gardening are probably when I was in first grade and my mother had a vegetable garden in Colorado and I remember picking rhubarb straight out of the garden and eating it just like that, sour as it was, and thinking that was just the greatest thing. My dad is a gardener and has a beautiful yard, and I guess that's always influenced me. A master gardener, Diana is always experimenting to find the best plants for her clay soil and to outwit the front yard's deer. When we moved into this house, the front yard was landscaped, and there was the pool and the cabana. But the backyard was scrub brush and stumps and rocks. And so um, that was my first project, was to take on putting in a yard for our daughter and doing some landscaping back here. Although she removed most of the existing plants, she kept the palm trees around the pool. In their borders, Diana selects no fuss, no muss plants, since the windy site would send fragile flowers straight into the pool. Back here around the pool, I think it needs a tropical sort of feel. Along with diversity and texture, Diana wants color. But she takes it easy and chooses her points of focus with intention, since these rooms are for winding down. Since Diana doesn't want to waste an inch of potential garden, she filled a raised bed behind the pool with color, fragrance, and wildlife sponsors. Beyond the patio, she wrangled scrub brush to extend the family's activity areas. I wanted to soften the space. We have, with the pool and the cabana and the kitchen out here, we have a lot of hardscape. And I really like the idea of softening that space out there. A priority was a playscape. At the time, their daughter Callie was an infant, but Diana's design anticipated the current escapades. She also earmarked room for a greenhouse, a recent addition that fills up in winter. Between the two, she made her cutting garden. Another priority was organic vegetables. I knew that the first thing I wanted to put in was a vegetable garden because uh, I think there's nothing better than fresh homegrown tomatoes and squash and all the wonderful vegetables we can grow here. For beauty with function, she built a winding path. Its granite seams are natural habitats for Texas tough visions of England. I trek back to the vegetable garden and the greenhouse a lot, and I would wear a path that way anyway. But um, I like the idea of softening it and creating um, something that's pretty and textured and colorful out into the grass. Um, just makes it a little more interesting. In the side yard, she beautifully handled another function. When we get those occasional heavy rains here in central Texas, the water comes from my neighbor's yard and comes down the driveway and comes down the front walkway and goes right in front of the front door of the house and right in front of the garage. So after you know a year or so of stepping in puddles to get into my own house, I decided we needed to do something about it. So um, we had some French drains put in, 
and um, we did the, the river rock bed walkway along the side of the house to, uh, to help with that. As Diana tackles one area after another, her son Dustin often jumps in to lend a hand or a new idea. In front, Diana's options for color and standout foliage face a caveat. The challenge in gardening with deer is that there are some deer resistant plants, but there are no deer proof plants. In years like we've had these last few summers where we have such a terrible drought and such terrible heat, they're starving and they will eat just about anything. Finding the compromise is important to her because this garden is about sharing. And along with plants that attract other wildlife, Diana wants a front yard that invites people to enjoy it. I want them to, to see layers and levels of plantings and things that are interesting, you know, different textures that play off of each other and, and color combinations that work really well together. Her blog, Sharing Nature's Garden, started over Jeff's suggestion at the breakfast table. About two weeks after he made the suggestion, I decided to try and I sat with my laptop late into the night trying to figure out blogger and all the rules and um, set it up myself and have been loving it ever since. It's given me an opportunity to meet another entire world of gardeners who share my passion for um, gardening. And, you know, it's a great opportunity to share ideas and to learn from each other. But it's also a chance for other gardeners to learn from her, including her wisdom that a garden is not all about work, but taking some time to have fun in it. We spend a lot of time here. Um, I spend a lot of time pruning and picking and digging, um, but I try to remember to just enjoy it too. Sometimes that's hard for gardeners, I found, a lot of my friends as well. It's hard to be outdoors in your space and just sit. So I've made a concerted effort to do that, but we do. We come out here and we, we swim and my husband cooks in the kitchen and we have family over. and. You know, just a few hours at a time. It doesn't even have to be an occasion. We just like to come out here and, and enjoy being outdoors. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. Uh, it's always great to get a peek into a blogger's garden. Right now we're going to be moving on and talking about deer-resistant plants and some unusual ones that may not be on your list uh, for the deer resistance. Joining me is Trisha Martin from Forever Gardens in Georgetown. And welcome back to Central Good Texas to be Gardener. Here. Always nice to have you here. Thank you. And Forever Gardens, just real briefly tell folks about the nursery and your location. In Georgetown, west of Sun City on Williams Drive. Um, mm -hmm. Road construction, a lot of road construction <laughs> out there, but we are still open. So Good come point. on out and see us when weather permits. When weather permits, indeed. This has been a trying <coughs> year for everybody, yes, I has. know, in the nursery business and elsewhere. Yes. Uh, trying, too, on the, the wildlife out yes. there. They're nibbling on just about anything they can nibble on. Anything and everything. Right. They'll try it all. And the deer, uh, we, we know <clears throat> to recommend and have been for years recommending plants that are with that heavy herbal kind of quality to them because Rosemary. we know the deer typically don't like those. Right. But all the plants that you're going to be recommending today um, are resistant for other reasons. For other reasons and maybe reasons I don't know. Right. They're not typically poisonous. Mm -hmm. um, they just, the deer don't eat them. Well, so lucky us. Yes. <laughs> a, a few things to be counted, we can count as blessings yes, right now, right? Yes. And why don't we dive in and just start okay. talking about these plants because right. I know people will be interested in this. The first one, and this kind of surprises me because this looks like deer candy Doesn't to me. It though? <laughs> Shrimp plant. Right. It's um, a kind of an old fashioned plant, mm -hmm. something you don't see everywhere anymore, but mm -hmm. maybe in grandma's backyard. Mm -hmm. um, very hardy, sun or shade, mm -hmm. and hummingbirds go crazy for it. So yeah. besides the deer not eating it, you're going to provide some nectar for the hummingbirds. Right. Now, I've always loved uh, the shrimp plants. Mm -hmm. I think the flower forms are so cool, Very so different. Yes. Um, tell me about the cultural conditions for this. Uh, you know, when I look at it, I, I'm assuming this is a plant that wants good garden soil. Decent garden soil, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be that particular. Okay. So some compost is always helpful in yeah. planting. Mm -hmm. um, 
If you're thinking of planting this fall, be sure and water the ground first before you do any planting for a several days, yeah, loosen it up, yeah. soften it up some. Yeah, and I th just a general tip on, all, you know, we can apply to anything, anything. we're talking about today. And that's a really good yes. one. Is the ground right now is like a brick. It is. And so if, is. You're, if, you're, if you intend to do some planting this fall, whatever plants you're mm -hmm. using, this, uh, this notion of watering, watering well before Yeah, plant. set the sprinkler out and water your ground before mm -hmm. you plant. Kind of get it ready to work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to dig up bricks. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes. Okay, so that... So, in sun mm -hmm. to shade, really, on the shrimp plant, mm -hmm. um, I always think of it in light shade or heavy shade. Okay. A little more sun, it's going to bloom better. Okay. Good. But it can take a fair amount of sun as well. All right. Well, again, uh, add that to the deer resistant right. list. And so from shrimp to pigeons, we're going to, to talk pigeons. about pigeons. <laughs> pigeon pigeon berry. Yes, <laughs> pigeon berry. And I don't know particularly that the pigeons love the berries, <laughs> but birds love the berries. Mm -hmm. And it blooms and has berries at the same time. Right. So attractive it's berries. Very attractive, too. low growing, a uh, great little native. I you know, I guess to the United States or southern United States, mm -hmm. but um, hardy, very drought tolerant, very mm -hmm. easy to grow, will self sow, not invasively, but mm -hmm. will give you a few extras along the way. Which is always nice. Yes. And I look at this flower and I say butterfly uh, plant. Um, the smaller butterflies mm -hmm. you'll the see. The skippers and yes. things like that. Yes, mm -hmm. not so much the big right. monarchs and whatnot, uh -huh. but the littler butterflies live it. But again, the birds, you'll see the little Wrens and berry-eating mm. birds hopping mm. all around. Good, good. Yeah. So pigeon berry is another one to add to the list. Yes. And attractive. and It's cute. And, and, and grows well in a variety of situations, yes. too. Really more shade than right. sun, but mm -hmm. certainly will tolerate some sun. Morning you would not sun. want to put this in the yeah, hot afternoon. afternoon. It would right. probably not right. be happy. Right. Great plant, though. Yes. And then below that, rock penstemon. I rock love the penstemons. I do, too. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the only penstemon that is deer-resistant. Mm -hmm. I, they may leave some alone, but they really leave this one alone. This one also, the hummingbirds like the flowers, and it blooms more frequently than the other penstemons do all season long, uh -huh. and it's evergreen. Yeah? Yeah. That's nice. So it's hard, but it wants sun. Okay. And the, like. Yeah, this is a tough drought tolerant plant. This is a tough plant. drought tolerant plant. Yes, it so is. So this covers the bill. It <laughs> right? does. It's <laughs> like, you got sun, you got deer, this is a good one to use. Right, right. Yes. And you know that salvia-like bloom, too, is always yes, it fun. Yes, mm -hmm. Okay, right next to that, we have dwarf Barbados cherry. Yes. This is a little shrub. Uh, that uh, has a really beautiful little blooms on it. It's very pretty, very lacy, very delicate, and mm -hmm. seem Unusual. typically blooms off and on all summer long, mm -hmm. but this year they're slowed down a little bit with the heat. Yeah. Um, and produces wonderful red, shiny red fruit mm -hmm. that the birds do like, and it's very high in vitamin C, though I've never eaten it. Right. I think it's kind of bitter, <laughs> but the birds like it. Well, and they need and vitamin the deer C, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it's beautiful. It makes a wonderful little hedge. Mm -hmm. um, How tall do they get? I'm always... I... They can get up three to four feet, okay. and they'll spread, and they'll, as roots or branches go across the ground, they'll root in. I see. So you can get even wider and wider, mm -hmm. but um, easily maintained in that three to four yeah. foot range. Nice little... You could plant little masses of them if you want to you make could. them they the evergreen. You could. They do air conditioners well. They're nice little uh, mass at a little height, good and thought. they'll take a f some shade. Right. They don't have right. to have full sun. Well, the next plant we're going to talk about is one of my all-time favorite natives. It's the Turk's Cap, and this is a gorgeous specimen. This one is really pretty. It's survived the summer very well in a container. Um, and, and I have to say, in, there are places in my garden that I have not watered once this year, and the Turk's Cap's still alive. Yeah, you know, you think of them being wanting more water, yeah. needing shade, and they prefer the shade, I think, but they're very drought-tolerant. And I think if the deer were hungry enough, they might nibble on it, mm -hmm. but typically they leave it alone. Yeah. And another hummingbird um, magnet, I would call it. Yeah. And they well, go crazy for it. It, it, it. To me, it, it may be like the signal plant of Austin. I think of it in I many ways. I think so, too. Yeah. And it's just, and it's easy to grow. Yeah. It doesn't require much, um, much mm. care from us. Right. That's true. Yeah. Uh, the fire bush is one that uh, uh, is a great kind of perennial in the garden, and it uh, grows from nothing in the. You cut it to the ground, and, all, and they get six feet tall. They get they get quite large actually, yeah. and right before your eyes, winters will kill them down. But they're typically root hardy here, and um, 
boy, the more sun you can throw at that thing, the better it will bloom. It'll yeah, do it some does, partial shade, but no, boy, it, really it wants the loves sun. the sun. Right. And, oh, I don't know. Hummingbirds go crazy, and actually I it's, see butterflies on it as well. Yeah, it is um, one of the best hummingbird plants I think you can plant. I think so, too. And, again, deer, for whatever reason, don't bother it. Okay. It doesn't well, stink, but it <laughs> they don't like it. Keep your secret, dude. There you go, whatever it is. <laughs> right next to that we have Thrasalis. Which I always confuse for senna for some reason. Uh, every time I look at it, it's the first thing that comes to my, my head. Similar flowers, but the Similar. leaves are a little different. The leaves are different. It's mm. really a tropical, kind of along the lines of the Mexican firebush, right. native to Mexico and right. South America. But very, very hardy here. Typically a deciduous shrub for us, mm -hmm. not even freezing to the ground in the winter. Okay, I didn't know that. Hard winters, though, cut it back. It'll, mm -hmm. you know, it'll freeze on down. Um, not particularly... Butterfly magnet or hummingbird food, but it's pretty for our eyes. You know, it's sure. nice to have something that's blooming when it's 110 outside, and this will do it. Um, the deer yeah. don't eat it. It loves sun. It will tolerate mm. some partial shade. Mm -hmm. um, very, very easy. Yeah. That's my kind of plants are easy plants. Well, you know, it's you like, know we, we need to be don't want to baby these guys. Right. And very drought tolerant. So drought tolerant. Deer, deer don't like it. That's right. It, it sounds like a winner. It takes full sun. Yes. What else could we ask for? Right? Not a lot. And then the last one is Duranta repens or Duranta. Yes. And uh, always love the, the blooms in these guys. And they're gorgeous. And the common name for them is sky flower mm -hmm. or golden dew drops, mm -hmm. which if you ever look close enough, you'll see the little seed pods look mm -hmm. like little golden berries. Right. They're attractive in themselves. Birds will nibble at those a little bit. Right, right. And they'll come in a variety of colors, actually. Mm -hmm. White, variegated, mm -hmm. um, pale purple and dark purple. Well, beautiful plants, and and it has a beautiful form as well, yes, a graceful kind of flowing form, great in containers or in the ground. Yes. Tricia, thank you so You're much. Good to great be. tips as always. Forever Gardens west of Georgetown, out by Sun City, right? That's right. Okay. Well, Look forward I, to seeing everybody. Well, I hope so. I hope so. It's like <laughs> let's get let's get that you know that fall attitude in there and head That's on right. back to the nurseries. Thank you. All right. Well, coming up next, it's Daphne. and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. This week's question comes from Angela. Like all of us suffering through this extended drought and these high temperatures, her new plants have burned leaves. First, her question is, how often should she water her new plants? Well, that depends on several factors, not the least of which is the weather. New plants have fewer roots and so will need to be watered more often until they get established, probably every day for a while. But aside from water issues, new plants often get burned by the sun. New plants especially are not accustomed to being in the full sun, and so they may, to be, they may need to be acclimated in a sunny spot on your porch before you actually plant them in the ground. But Angela came up with a great tip for us too. She bought some black weed cloth and attached it to posts to create shade for the burning plants. At first she did what we all do, hit the shed for ideas. She tried old tiki torches and hooked the cloth to that. Well, if you've ever used tiki torches, you can guess what happened. The wind blew those right out of the ground pretty quickly. So then Angela tried some bamboo sticks with pretty much the same result. Then she got some steel bars borrowed from her neighbor and used old sturdy clips to attach her weed cloth. She tried bricks, but writes, even though there isn't much wind here, if you attach material to a post, it will act like a flag and start blowing. We love Angela's tip for resourceful ideas. For sure, shading her new plants will help them make it. Within a few days, they were all back on track. And although you can use just about anything to shade a plant, her solution blends nicely with the front of the house. Thanks, Angela. Our plant this week is Flame Acanthus, Anisacanthus quadrifidus, variety Ridei. From midsummer through frost, this plant is covered with long, slender, red or reddish orange blooms that are hummingbird magnets. Flame acanthus loves the heat and is extremely drought tolerant, but will produce more flowers if it's watered a little more during the hottest, driest times. It generally stays under three feet tall and wide, but can get a little bigger. It's a very small, deciduous, shrubby plant and will benefit from hard pruning in the early spring. It's hardy to zone seven and can be treated like a perennial and sheared to the ground before new growth emerges. Flame acanthus is late to come out in the spring, and a good pruning will make the plant bushier and less leggy. 
It grows naturally on rocky banks and floodplains and prefers well-drained soils, but also does well in heavier soil types in sunny to partly shady areas of the home landscape. And although no plant can ever truly be listed as deer proof, this plant is extremely deer resistant. Our pet this week is Mr. Leo. When Louise and her husband rescued him, he was a feral cat living on the golf course behind their home. It took them almost a year to coax him into the house to be the caretakers that saved his life. His left eye is completely dilated and he has feline AIDS. Leo was a bag of bones but now has a beautiful healthy coat. He loves to eat any kind of grass, even fountain grass. And Louise writes, no matter how much time we have left with him, we will always adore him and he has enriched our lives immensely. Thank you, Louise, for giving Leo a second chance and enriching our lives with your story. To do in your garden this week, if you're anything like my, me, your garden needs a little pick-me-up after such a harsh summer. And if so, plant a few fall flowering chrysanthemums, even a, in a container by the door, to lift your spirits and remind yourself that a new season is indeed on its way. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions, plants, and pets of the week. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgel for Backyard Basics. Hello gardening friends, welcome to Backyard Basics. Well, one of the more common questions that uh, comes in here at the studios is about lawn lately. Different problems in the lawns really frustrate people in identifying them and treating them successfully and even preventing them. So uh, we're going to address that a little bit. Uh, it takes um, uh, a good observation uh, the first couple of times by maybe a professional or maybe you go by a nursery to help you identify uh, some of the problems that we find out in our lawns. Brown patch seems to be the one that's most common, but we don't see much of it in the summertime. We see it start in the fall. These little yellow areas, small circles, uh, start out and you know that's where you're going to have your brown patch next year. Or if you had it the previous year, that's probably the same location that you're going to get it again. So you know that that's where you're going to have to treat. And there are natural fungicides out there that you can treat with. So we'll think about those in a minute, but um, that's what you'd go out there and treat early on here. You know, one of the important things about a healthy lawn is to get rid of the thatch. The thatch is this brown material right underneath here that just builds up like straw. It won't break down. The beneficial organisms just don't break it down. And it stays there and accumulates like a thatched roof on the coast somewhere. That's a problem. A, rain can't really get through there, and uh, B, it's a good habitat for uh, insects and other problems. Or it carries over the spores from year to year for the uh, lawns to start up again the next year and get going even though you treated them. Now this right here is something that's been active in the summertime. It's called take all. And of course, you can imagine by the name what it really does. It just expands and expands in the yard until it takes as much as it uh, can. And so um, you look at these little leaf axles right in here, and in the axle, you'll find some fungal spores growing. And so that's going to be the take-all. With brown patch, you see these perfect circles, just perfect circles out there. Even the edge is either yellowing or beginning to die back. That's brown patch. It's easy to identify by the perfect circle that it's uh, growing in. And uh, brown patch, though, doesn't kill the lawn. It always comes back. The runners are still green, but the leaves are rotting off. But it will recuperate, and uh, by the next spring, you begin to see the growth. The center of the brown patch areas is usually kind of green and beginning to grow back out. So that's the brown patch. Chinch bugs also do damage. It looks a little bit like this. And um, they're this um, slender, one-fifth to one-sixth inch long insect. And they get in there, and you can identify their damage because it's real sporadic. There's a little plant still growing, but it's all dead around it. And then there's another one. And it continues down areas, usually near sidewalks. But it'll move right out into the garden also. There are beneficial insects, uh, spiders and ants and some beetles that live down there. So if you spray with the strong insecticide to get rid of the um, uh, insects, the, then you, what you're going to do is kill the beneficials at the same time. 
So chinch bugs really are a problem, but it's good to look at them like you do other parts of the garden. And so it's another time to take the thatch out of there so they can't hide under it. And what we like to use is diatomaceous earth. Once they're exposed, we'll use the diatomaceous earth in there and get rid of the chinch bugs. So those are a couple of the diseases that you're going to find around your home landscape. And fungicides that are natural like these do the job for you. So don't forget, go ahead and treat it as soon as you get started because when you do that, you'll be able to nip it in the bud. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next week. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online and get more tips. Next week, get ready to plant wildflower seeds. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Thank you.